Bienvenidos a Welcome to the first symposium of the Uniservitate program, service learning in higher education. We expected to hold this symposium in August, but due to the pandemic that is affecting the entire world, we decided to postpone it and to hold it in a virtual mode. But we thought it was important for us to continue with this activity to renew the commitment of higher education institutions, especially Catholic uh, universities that are part of the program and the entire Uniservitate program team to convey a message of hope to all of the people who are on the same ship with us uh, facing this storm to promote service learning and its impact on comprehensive education. The purpose of this symposium is to launch a cycle of symposia for the Uniservitate program, service learning in Catholic higher education as a multicultural, global, and pluralistic space around the contributions of the service learning pedagogical proposal to comprehensive education in higher education. We also want to reflect on and do research into the spiritual dimension of service learning and its contribution to the identity and mission of higher education Catholic institutions. And we want to facilitate the exchange among experts, authorities, and faculty members of higher education institutions in different cultural contexts in different parts of the world around the social university um, engagement um, and practices and service learning programs. I would like to introduce Richard Bros, who is um, the, from Portugal. So, Thank you, Maya Rosa. Dear participants, a warm welcome to the first symposium of our university program. This program uh, would not be thinkable without the precious collaboration of CLAES, of course, at the coordinating institution, but also of the Federation of Catholic Universities, IFCU, of AQ, of AVEPRO, of various universities all over the continents, of many leading scholars. Catholic or not, passionate about the methodology of service learning. The program is still in an early stage, but your commitment is already impressive. And we will try to mirror all your incredible contributions to the program on the website. When we will look back at this initiative in some years from now, I do hope that we will be able to adopt the famous sentence of Winston Churchill in 1940 when he stated, never so much has been done by so many, to, for so many, by so few, with so little. So why so few? Indeed, even if our audience today is really impressive, we remain a limited group of people convinced by the profound added value of what we call quality service learning. Catholic universities represent only some 5% of all higher ed institutions over the world, and they can be seen as a niche in this special landscape. Nevertheless, we at Porticus are convinced that Catholic universities are something to share and demonstrate as to the value of an integral education, which is a holistic education inspired by Christian anthropology. Of course, we would have dreamed of better circumstances for organizing the first symposium. The pandemic is affecting almost all countries around the globe at various stages, in different waves, with more or less impact depending on the genius and wisdom of the politicians in power. So let's recall at the beginning of our meeting, all the victims of this pandemic, all the families affected by a loss or by a severe sick member, all the professionals involved in the daily fight against the virus. All the people ensuring that our societies still function 
even if with some restrictions. For the pandemic has first a human face and service learning means today the service to those suffering from the pandemic as well. This is our field hospital in these days. But the pandemic had also a structural phase, not less worrying for our universities. You may have seen a recent article in the New York Times explaining how US colleges clash budgets in the pandemic. Let me summarize just some few aspects. The coronavirus is forcing large and small universities to make deep and lasting costs. Most of the suspensions of program are in social sciences and in humanities. It affects disproportionately students from low income households. The crisis encouraged institutions to downsize and to fire faculty. And these cuts are likely going to continue long past the pandemic. Of course, the article tackles a specific situation of higher ed in the US, but we will recognize some pertinence of the diagnostic in our respective areas. Therefore, I do hope that you will find some support in our reflections over the coming two days about the why, the what, and the how of service learning in higher ed. In this effort, we have received a recent and unexpected support by the latest encyclical Fratelli Tutti. You will certainly hear more about it about during the coming workshops and roundtables, but allow me to allude to two simple points. First, the necessity to constantly broaden our horizon to generate fraternity. So the Pope quoting Karl Rana, we always have to take up the challenge of moving beyond ourselves. And second, the invitation to look at Catholic universities as places to learn not only critical thinking, the ability of rational reasoning and arguing, but also as places to learn social love, which is a force capable of inspiring new ways of approaching the problems of today's world. So in this spirit, I wish you all an inspiring symposium and a great learning experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for your meaningful words and for your, your permanent support to develop this program. I will now do a brief presentation of the Unicervitate program. So I will be sharing my screen for you to, for everybody to learn about the program. A continuación, voy a realizar una presentación. So now I'm going to uh, give a presentation on the Unicervitate program for you to um, know about our proposal. The Unicervitate program is intended to generate a systemic change in Catholic higher education institutions through the institutionalization of service learning as a tool to achieve its mission of an integral and comprehensive education. This program has the support from Pope Francis through the various publications and messages that he transmits for the promotion of service learning. And at the same time, with the important global current that is developing to propose this, precisely because of the impact it has not only on academic quality, but also on the involvement of the students to provide a response based on their professional training. The Unicevitate program 
chose as its name the combination of the words university and service, as if it were a Latin, a word in Latin to become a single word. And the logo is intended to represent through this geometric shape this uh, idea of globalization that reflects the convergence of all the parts, but trying to preserve their differences. This is a global program where we want to see to the particularities of the institutions that are part of our program for, from all regions. The sum of all the people in a society that looks for common good that really wants to provide a place for each and every one. And we also try to represent this comprehensive education that is possible through service learning, including head, hands, and mainly the heart. These are the action lines of this program that initially is the program that we are developing. Now it's uh, the first three-year stage. We hope it's going to be an over 10-year program. It's to work on the research and reflection on the spiritual dimension of service learning. So we try to promote meetings like the one we are starting today to develop appropriate models for the identity and mission of Catholic higher education institutions around the world, but as Richard mentioned, also for all those higher education institutions that are interested in an integral education, seeing to the diversity of the multicultural and multi-religious contexts. So for that, we try to create a global network of regional hubs in order to have our reference in each region and to promote a permanent construction of a critical mass to reach all the Catholic institutions in each region through various communication systems, as I'm going to show afterwards. And the the objective of this program is to develop a global award to recognize and show the best practices that are developed in service learning in Catholic higher education and also to establish global standards for quality in service learning and give visibility to everything that has been done. And for that, we want to develop skills to institutionalize service learning. We know that there are many institutions with initiatives of this sort, but we want to accompany them and support them so that they can have a long reach uh, impact. So we're going to work on that, and we've started already with some universities is. We are providing training and train the trainers courses. And we are working with around 20 universities around the world to achieve this institutionalization of service learning. How are we organized? Well, our program has different levels. The coordination of the Unisovitate program, of course, is led by Porticus the portfolio of Catholic higher education and CLIES, the Latin American Center of Service Learning. And in order to um, support one another in this coordination, we have an academic council made up of experts and specialists that are very experienced from all the continents, and um, research and spirituality team to systematize all our learnings in this program and to share the, that learning. We also have a network of regional hubs and collaborators and institutions to reach each region and to accompany in this third level the universities that we are now uh, inviting and we are evaluating their applications to see what universities we can incorporate in this first part of the program. And we also want to go beyond this small group that we will be working with. And we will be working with all Catholic higher education institutions from the various actions that we will be developing. But 
to all higher education institutions in general, public, private, confessional, non-confessional, because we are convinced that, as we said at the beginning, right now and in the context we are in, this is the moment for educational institutions to share all their knowledge at the service of a fairer and more supportive society. And service learning is the tool that we think is the most appropriate to balance academic quality and a genuine commitment with the education of our students. As I said, in the program, we have regional hubs that accompany us. We have in the US and Canada. We have the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities for Latin America, the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile for the north of Europe, the Leuven University for Central and Eastern Europe and Middle East, the Catholic University of Eichstätt, for Southern Europe, the University of Deusto, for Africa, the Tangasa University College from Kenya, and for Asia, the La Salle University from Manila, Philippines. All this large network is permanently supported by the generous work of the International Federation of Catholic Universities, IFCU, and also the Agency for the uh, Assessment of the Quality of Ecclesiastical uh, Universities and Colleges of the Holy See. And the idea is to support and to disseminate the work that from various international uh, networks has been done for the promotion of service learning because we are interested in reaching as many institutions as possible in the world. And for that, we work at different levels, at a theoretical level, then at network level, and um, more individually with educational institutions. And for that, we want to invite you to stay in touch with us so we, you can participate in the various levels and activities like this international symposium or the various publications that we want to share as part of the program. So we invite you to visit our webpage, unisovitate.org, where you can find all the news that we've been developing. The symposium, for instance, there you can find all the updates and the links to participate in the activities and have access to the presentations. And in order to share the publications, we are developing this digital repository where, based on different categories and topics that we've been designing with the team on research and spirituality, you can find all the literature related to our subject matter so that you can have access to this repository that I hope we can build it jointly with the contributions of all uh, those that are part of the program. Therefore, so as not to take more time, I invite you to follow us on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, where we hope we can share the reflections not only of the team, but of each and every one of you, so you can share your stories and to give visibility to all the work that has been done from higher education to give a significant response to the challenges of current society. So with this, I close this brief uh, introduction of the program. You can find any information, of course, through the website. We stay in touch, and I hope you can enjoy this first global symposium of Unisorbitate. Now I would like to welcome Professor Nieves Tapia. Let me introduce you, Nieves, first. 
todos los que eh, promueven el aprendizaje de servicios seguramente. All of you doing service learning probably have had the chance to read her publications and listen to her numerous presentations in different parts of the world. But uh, Professor Maria Nieves Tapias is going to talk about service learning, econ academic excellence, and uh, social engagement in higher education. She is the director of the Latin American Service Learning Center. She is the creator of CLIS. And she has been promoting service learning from different areas. And we wanted her to share with us a few thoughts about service learning in higher education institutions. Since 1997 and 2009, and she coordinated service learning programs at the national level the community school program and the service learning schools program in the city of Buenos Aires. She has a degree in history. She was a teacher in various universities, the Catholic University, the University of Buenos Aires, and she's currently teaching a service learning uh, seminar in Flaxo. She's also a founding member of the International Association of Service Learning Research Researchers, and she was also awarded a prize for leadership uh, in um, youth. And uh, she has authored different books in different languages. Service learning in the school, service learning, and the educational system in youth organizations. She was also the recipient of the Max um, International Award to University Social Engagement. And we will have the pleasure to listen to her at the opening of this symposium. Thank you. Maria Rosa, good morning to all South Americans starting the day on Thursday. Good afternoon to the Europeans who are listening to us. And good evening to all of you listening to us from Asia. To be honest, it is a, a great celebration for us to start with this new cycle of symposia and uh, the Uniservitate program that uh, Maria Rosa has just presented. As she was saying, although the program uh, will make focus on some central elements of Catholic education, I just wanted to share a few thoughts about service learning contributions uh, at a global level. My presentation and the panel after my talk will try to give an overview of the universities in different parts of the world with different backgrounds, different beliefs, different types of management on service learning. So I'm going to share with you now a presentation. I apologize beforehand to the interpreters because I will probably speak quite fast. But uh, I want to talk about service learning as a convergence of academic excellence and social engagement in higher education. This may be a provocative uh, title because oftentimes in the minds of our colleagues, we either work for uh, academic excellence or for social engagement. So let me start with this. Uh, 
quote from a group of students that were uh, doing service learning. They were the first winners of the service learning award in Argentina. They said, for some universities, uh, the purpose of their existence is academic excellence. We consider that the reason for our being is service to people and academic excellence is the best tool. So I think that this statement is enough uh, to understand what we are talking about. We are talking about universities that seek academic excellence, uh, not as a goal in itself, not to be among the best ranked universities or to have a lot of publications in uh, high reputation academic journals. All that uh, research, all that academic excellence, all that knowledge generation makes sense if it makes sense for our people. So since we are now in the context of a global program, and I used to teach history, I just wanted to say that this idea of social mission of higher education is as old as higher education itself. Historians say that the first few higher education institutions were the ones that uh, existed in Egypt, in Sumeria, in the uh, Chinese Empire, in the Mayan, Azteca, and Inca uh, empires in the Americas. Those initial higher education institutions clearly aimed at educating those that were going to be in charge of administering the empire. Therefore, they would have to work for the common good. Higher education and different levels uh, uh, for Plato and Aristotle showed uh, the education institution separate from the religious component. But then through the Islam and Christianity, um, spirituality took a central role. And in modern times, a clear difference was uh, made between religious universities and secular uh, universities. And and in times of Napoleon, of Napoleon, we know that science plays a very important role. And these models that developed over, the, over time belong to a culture, to a certain time period, to a certain way of thinking. For other regions of the world that are part of uh, the Uniservitate family, we were colonized by universities that follow the Salamanca, or the Cambridge, or the Sorbonne models, or that of the German universities. We inherited higher education models that forced us to think whether we owned those models or not. And the truth is that higher education, first in the Americas and then in other parts of the world, started uh, focusing more clearly from the U.S. land-grant universities, uh, those universities that were founded in the um, march to the West, where there were resources and facilitation of production in those regions so that they would conquest uh, the prairies with agricultural techniques, with production techniques that will enable the settlers to have a better living standard. That model of university, deeply rooted in the context, was quite different from other university models, just like the Latin American university reform movement differentiated itself from the colonial legacy, trying to develop a university that could be universities not to, for, for themselves, but for the people. That, those were the words of one of the first uh, deans of uh, the National University of Mexico. In Mexico, they were the first one of the first countries to determine that their students had to engage in social uh, 
engagement practices. In Africa and Asia, a lot is said still about the decolonization of universities. The University of Cape Town, you may see the architecture that doesn't resemble the African culture. So somehow that is the legacy of uh, um, other cultures. And after uh, surviving uh, the apartheid in South Africa, uh, they are engaging in service learning experiences that for them makes a lot, make a lot of sense. So we are the heirs of a long history when extension activities were the novelty as they appear in the 19th century in Cambridge, there were information dissemination activities outreach activities to, through which the university tried to reach out to the community. All the way to the Latin American extension uh, model that had voluntary activities that turn into a permanent function. So then we saw the emergence of these three pillars of universities, teaching, research, and extension was the third pillar. This is quite an old idea in the United States and in Latin America, but in other regions of the world, this is quite new. It is also new, uh, the vision that showed that this pillar was somehow detached from academic life. It seems that we are less important, that nobody pays as much attention to us as to the other two pillars. So this is a true false antinomy between those that are engaged and the serious people. You have the scholars who publish, and then those those that are engaged and committed to dealing with uh, the reality. But throughout the 20th century, different conceptualizations of the social mission of higher education have helped us see the complexity of the social mission. And although initially the first formulations, uh, social service, social commitment or extension were conceived from the inside to the outside. Later on, we saw the advent of other concepts that uh, spoke about the involvement of students, volunteering programs, community service in the 1960s, service learning came to the scene. And especially in the 1970s, we saw a deepening of this idea that a committed university is a university whose research is committed with their reality and through research activities, through participatory um, activities and all shops, different research models uh, were implemented with community participation. It is for that reason that in the 1990s, we started seeing the emergence of uh, more comprehensive notions, engagement, university social responsibility. These names for Catholic universities are terms that already in the past in the Vatican, um, there was uh, talk about uh, education with this kind of characteristics. But in the 21st century, we started moving towards uh, other type of models that coordinate uh, and combine these uh, three pillars. We are teaching and research have to be integrated now. 
with uh, uh, extension and also with institutional management. We realize that we need institutional policies that view research, uh, teaching, and extension as a path to establish a dialogue with the community to make the walls of the university uh, more per more open to the community. Today and tomorrow, we will um, hear a lot about universities and their missionary departure, but as Pope Francis says, but this has to do with having an impact uh, on the way we teach based on what we do with the community. So far, everything seems quite theoretical, except for those who are already practicing service learning. But as Younger says, uh, the British expert, social engagement is no longer seen as a third pillar, but rather as a critical approach to our teaching and research activities. So in this regard, service learning, with its different names, is at the heart of this new paradigm. In this place where you see the convergence of teaching, research, and extension in dialogue with the community. So let me share with you an example. The first case that I want to share with you has to do with the students that I mentioned initially. In the School of Medicine of the National University of Tucumán, a state-run university in the north of Argentina, decades ago established some compulsory internships in uh, social in, in community engagement. When they graduate, they have to spend six months in healthcare services in the peripheral area of the city or in rural areas, and they do some professional practice there, but they also try to help the community with some health-related problems they have. So in this service learning experience, they have the teaching components similar to what you have in other practices, in other professional practices. But it also has a clear service component. In this case, this project was carried out at a time when there was a serious uh, crisis of uh, um, malnourishment uh, in that province. So they would go um, to the different uh, houses in the community knocking at doors and trying to examine children in the families and be able to early detect uh, malnutrition uh, among children in order to prevent a more serious consequences. These students, uh, throughout the two years of this project, saved over 450 children that were in a condition of malnutrition and they accompanied through their recovery. But besides saving all their lives, they developed a research project asking why malnutrition was so high in that city, in that province. And they found out that one of the answers was that breastfeeding had been abandoned as a practice. So that uh, project led to an outreach project where the students in the first years went to the waiting rooms at the maternities and the hospitals and public hospitals to train future mothers about the importance of breastfeeding. So all this is the movement of the university at the service of the community. But all this experience also had a way back because the students wondered how much they, as future physicians, had been trained in the issues of breastfeeding, how much importance was the university giving to this that was an essential public health issue in their province. So this led to a modification of the curricula and the creation of a course on breastfeeding and public health in the province. So it's this virtuous cycle of service and learning by serving that happens not only 
within our students' lives, but also in the lives of our teachers and our institutions. So trying to organize that babel of the different terms from the 20th century around um, social engagement at university, we may say that the institutional management is one that defines the general policies for social engagement or university social responsibility. We've spoken of service learning. And then we have these spaces where there's an overlay or a, like, for instance, the dissemination courses, engaged research, or what is typical of each area, like volunteer programs or research and teaching. So in this scheme, I would say we are facing a new institutional paradigm that is not only a pedagogical innovation. Service learning effectively is an innovation that is part of a large family of active pedagogies and the search for meaningful learning as we can see uh, the problem-based learning, learn by design, etc. As any innovation, it implies innovating in the role of the faculty members coming down from the chair to be more next to the students and learning with them, letting reality ask the questions that perhaps we had not planned for the course. But it's also a new paradigm from the epistemological perspective because it implies a construction of knowledge that is multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, meta-disciplinary, our own problems that are significant and relevant for our context. It implies, as we will see throughout these days, establishing serious, substantial dialogues, not just a full dialogue, truly serious language uh, dialogues between the academic knowledge and the popular and native knowledge. And finally, it's also a paradigm shift at the institutional level because it implies coming out of the ivory tower to be an institution that works as part of collaborative networks, not as beneficiaries, as, but as partners, co-creators, co-producers of knowledge, co-teachers. We might speak a lot about this, but I would just like to summarize this paradigm shift with something that Pope Francis said to the Catholic University of Portugal that I think applies to any university. He says, it's fair that we ask ourselves, how do you help our flora there? That's a field visit. Although it is contributing to the maintenance and the preservation of this natural park. On the other end, we have the asystematic initiatives that are occasional, what Latin America call the campaigns often. When the tsunami hit, the students went out with the teachers and staff to try and help alleviate the consequences of the tsunami. But as the tsunami doesn't come only once, but several times, the university decided to generate this permanent core of volunteers where the students could uh, register and join it to be well prepared for the next tsunami. And in this kind of experiences of institutional volunteering, it doesn't matter if you study medicine, architecture, social sciences, or philosophy. What matters is that you are willing to help and contribute. And I'm sure these activities are truly formational personally and from the concept of the values. But we speak of service learning when, as in this case, these are students of medicine that are uh, studying ophthalmology and they are contributing to measuring uh, and prescribing glasses to the rural uh, populations that have no access to healthcare facilities. So in service learning, we have the academic rigor of uh, the practice in the field and all the volunteer attitude of a volunteering program. Sometimes service learning programs are well defined from the very beginning. And sometimes you reach them as part of a transition that can imply adding some articulation with the curricula, what has been done from the solidarity campaigns or the pastoral work or 
students' groups, or by applying the knowledge that we have to develop in our subjects at the service of social needs. I'm going to give you an example as brief as possible of the Catholic University of Córdoba. Tomorrow you will be able to listen to Daniela Gargantini, the leader of this project. This started as many other things in Catholic universities with a group of missionaries, as if it can, as if it was the outreach group of a university. And the students, the volunteers of architecture, that were um, aware of the precarious conditions of the houses, they proposed this optional course of studying the situation the housing situation and provide a service to these um, populations in the periphery. Now, this project is a mandatory subject because when the curricula was modified, the students asked for this to be mandatory because they realized that if they, they had the teaching aspect, but they also had the dialogue with the community stakeholders, and they had the situated research, but a, a research that was conducted in the field with a dialogue with the community to find out what had to be built, what had to be improved, how to do it, what was the best option. And in that way, and this is mentioned by the students, they acquired an experience that the, of the profession of architect that no other subject had given them. This picture that you are seeing is uh, one of the neighborhoods that was built with funds from the Inter-American Development Bank because the students at the Catholic University contributed to this um, community organization having the proper layouts, the blueprints and all the requirements of the uh, IDB to uh, tender for those funds. So uh, this subject was created many years ago, and it, it has its prehistory because many times the best projects come out of insistence and continuity. But in order to be realistic, we should say that not all projects of service learning are that good and they are not all the same. And that the transitions sometimes happen between projects that have some service and some learning and other projects where perhaps there's more service and learning or the other way around. Until finally, we reach the maturity in service learning projects that are quality projects where both academic excellence and social engagement are balanced and are equally significant and with the same quality. That is why we say that there are three main components in order to come up with a quality service learning model. Although in a narrow way, the service needs to be effective in uh, addressing real and perceived needs of the community and working with the community, not only for the community. In Spanish, we always add the term solidarity to the English term service learning because we want to make sure that this will not be any kind of service. The second characteristic is the active leadership of students from beginning to end. And the third characteristic that differentiates service learning from other volunteering programs programs is that teachers know what the community demands are, but we also know what students can learn while addressing that demand in terms of uh, no practical knowledge, but also reflection on those practices. How we are going to use uh, service spaces in order to develop competencies and skills for citizenship, work, and um, Professions. When we talk about the service component, uh, along with solidarity, we want to draw a line to differentiate charitable activities and that may end up in clientelism or uh, 
the like, and this self-complacent feeling that makes us feel good and without guilt. And without knowing that we may be reproducing situations of injustice. And we want to differentiate this from the true solidarity that has to do with acknowledging the value of fraternity. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis recognizes uh, the principles of fraternity the secular institutions recognize fraternity in the French Revolution, but it has to do with the search for justice. And it implies uh, establishing empathy, the soft skills, and an exchange and a collective building of the knowledge required to truly transform reality and not to leave it unchanged. The leading role of students means that they should be able to share management of the process, uh, make decisions, and also the um, integration of uh, service learning practices into the curriculum. There are different ways of integrating service learning practices into the curriculum. I'm not going to delve into this, but this is a publication that we had on social engagement in the curriculum of higher education is still in Spanish, but soon we will have it in English. And this is just an example, because you can do service learning in any field and from any subject. It was a surprise to me to see that you could have a subject called uh, pavement that um, was uh, that would lend itself to service learning. There was a city that um, had problems um, with the pavement of the streets that uh, was constantly um, deteriorated. Uh, the events that have been used for paving those streets were not the appropriate ones for the climatic conditions of the city of Cali. The teachers said that when dealing with the current issues and problems, the course becomes uh, adequate and sensitive to social problems. As a result, you have a tangible product that can be shared with the target audience with a strong link between the academic learning life and um, communities. So this is a good service learning practice, service to academic excellence, because you need to learn much more in to solve uh, real problems than just to pass an exam. And you need to know much more to transform reality than to describe it, which is usually what is easier to do. I'm not going to dwell into this, but there is a lot of evidence from research showing how service learning can have a positive impact on students, precisely along those three pillars of education for the 21st century, or the four pillars described by UNESCO. In in a report to learn uh, how to learn, to learn to be and to live together and to learn to do. As Pope Francis said, you have to bring together the language of the head, the heart, and the hands. In the 19th century, the university focused on the minds, on the head. But now it seems that uh, we are talking so much about empathy and new sensitivities that we were just going to focus on the heart. But an integral education, a holistic education, the kind of education required by the 21st century is an education that uh, brings together the head, the heart, and the hands. And uh, this is um, something that, according to research, uh, is found in service learning practices. Uniservitate wants not only to multiply service learning projects, it also wants to multiply institutional service learning uh, policies, uh, to institutionalize service learning as part of our institution's identities. To that end, we need 
institutional policy decisions that have to be made by the authorities. But at the same time, we know that usually service learning uh, uh, grows in a bottom-up fashion with a few uh, enthusiastic people who start building a critical mass of engaged uh, students and teachers, establishing partnerships with others in the environment. And this point of convergence between institutional decision and the critical mass uh, results in the best institutional policies. Just to cite an example from the Catholic University of Temuco in the south of Chile, they launched a project uh, with the School of Veterinary Sciences uh, um, the students um, had to address a problem in the city. There were a lot of stray dogs and cats in the streets. So the project was launched, and this led to a process that resulted in the establishment of an institutional curriculum in which the animal well-being, uh, dealing with uh, animals at risk, and uh, public health consequences we are addressed through different subjects with simple projects uh, in first year students that help vaccinate uh, animals all the way to the pre-professional practices in the last few years with surgery, um, medical examinations, and also with the thesis on public health and a small animal medicine. This differentiates an isolated project out of the wheel of an individual teacher from service learning that becomes part of the backbone of research and teaching in the university. Therefore, an engaged university, in the case of Catholic universities, policies, management, everything relates to the university's identity and mission. And this is what we are going to uh, work on tomorrow in one of the panels. But let me give you an introductory uh, reflection. The spiritual dimension is not just the religious dimension. Many of our students uh, who are atheists also want to uh, preserve a spiritual dimension. They want to reflect on the meaning of life. And through service learning, we can offer them a space to do that, uh, to learn about solidarity values, fraternity, justice, the importance of citizenship engagement as potential pillars of their life projects. But we also know that there is a golden rule that uh, unites us, all of us who have different religious beliefs. And that is that service learning can also serve as a springboard to generate spaces for service and ecumenic uh, dialogue, religious and interreligious uh, dialogue, and also to develop a Christian spirituality, Catholic meditation and reflection around the fraternal service. All of us know when we read the gospel, we know what uh, questions we are going to be asked on the last day. And if we help our students uh, learn how to love their brothers and sisters uh, through service learning projects, even though they may have arguments with priests or they don't have any religious beliefs, they will have learned uh, to answer the questions of that final exam at the end of their lives. What will matter is how much we have loved those that are around. Does. So, let me conclude with uh, where Richard left it. As Mario Benedetti, the Uruguayan writer, used to say, when we thought we had all the answers, suddenly they changed us all the questions. So coronavirus came into play, and we asked ourselves whether we could continue practicing service learning during the pandemic. On our website in class, uh, we have this map, and we invite all service learning practitioners to mark 
the approaches here on the map, and we see that the experiences have multiplied. So if you are listening to us, if you are engaged in service learning projects, please mark your location here in the map, because we want to continue with volunteering, with campaigns, and with service learning, also in times of pandemic, in times of Zoom, and there's boxes for gerontology students in the social sciences school of the University of Singapore meant having uh, physical lessons for the elderly now through uh, this virtual modality through Zoom, but still rendering a service to the elderly who live alone in Singapore. There is a lot of virtual service learning uh, during the pandemic, but we also have face-to-face -face and hybrid service learning activities. So let me pay tribute especially to all those students of all parts of the world that uh, despite these virtual times are also going out to the streets with all the precautionary measures to service their communities in these difficult times. And I want to pay tribute also to universities that have been quick to react to uh, generate coherent and consistent uh, policies with empty classrooms now doing lessons through uh, a screen, but also opening their spaces for those that need shelter, to have a place, and we transform empty classrooms into isolation areas, and we continue to do service learning even in the most challenging conditions. I hope that many universities can find in the pandemic the calling to engage in committed service learning experiences. I hope that all of us can start thinking the day after about everything that we have seen suffered a loss during these difficult times, and that we can come up with better educational practices, better and safer service learning projects, and better institutional policies. In one of the streets of Buenos Aires, somebody wrote this. We are all the vaccine, and I think that the, in the first line, we are the vaccine, not only against coronavirus, but also against a lot of suffering and insecurity that exists in the world. Those of us trying to build engaged uh, universities are part of that vaccine. Once I heard one of the pioneers of service learning in the U.S. saying that they wanted to change the world and that universities uh, turn that into a way of changing pedagogy. I think there is no contradiction there because as Pope Francis says, we are not going to change the world if we don't change education. And with service learning, we are walking in that direction. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Nieves, for your presentation and for this journey along the history of service learning, looking at multiple contexts and also the current pandemic situation. Those of you who are in doing service learning and want to learn more, and also to uh, also connect with those that are just starting. So um, here we see the transcendental importance of service learning on the community, on academic excellence, and also on our own lives. Those of us who engage in service learning can also find meaning in the actions that we carry out. So thank you so much, Nieves, for sharing all these thoughts with us. Um, to all of you who are listening to us from different parts of the can of the world and different religions and different languages, I would like to remind you that we are streaming this symposium through YouTube channels. In the description of this presentation, you will find more detailed information because this is being streamed in English, in Spanish, and in French in three different channels. So you can choose the language of your choice. 
in order to benefit from this symposium. In our Uniservitate webpage, you will find a lot of information, and we will be also posting information through our social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And please uh, pay attention for the next uh, conference. By You can subscribe to this channel so you can get the alerts when we stream the next uh, panel. So once again, thank you, Nieves, for your presentation. We continue with this first uh, global Uniservitate Symposium.